Hello, and welcome to the second video of the series on microservices. I'm Jonathan Schabowski, and I'm a senior architect focused on the practical use of microservices. Today's discussion is around the RESTful request response paradox, and we'll explore the areas in which REST APIs excel and areas where they simply don't. The goal of this video installment is to soberly look at the ways that microservices can communicate and recognize that there really is no one-size-fits-all solution. Needless to say, we're often asked at Solace, why can't we just exclusively use REST APIs to, for the inter-process communications between microservices? Well, this presentation is the start of that answer. So before we jump all in, let's first discuss the reason why APIs have become so popular in systems today. First, when we all learned to program, maybe that was back in college, we made local function calls and they just returned. That's how APIs work. You invoke them and they return the data that you requested. And that's ultimately the case with REST, only it's remote. So it fits within the paradigm that we've always used around invoking functions. Next is that APIs in REST really make development easy. You know, rich development tooling support such as OpenAPI, Swagger, um, and Spring make both the development of clients and service implementations easy. Additionally, the surrounding infrastructure really came from making the internet work at scale, since HTTP is really the protocol of the internet and of REST. Thus, it's mature and supports security requirements for B2B and B2B, B2C service interactions. And lastly, the concept of resource-based services and the actions that you take on resources, i.e. post, put, update, delete, etc., they really do map nicely to database semantics. Therefore, it makes it really easy to design APIs with database persistence. The net of this is that the reasons that they're used today are largely good and justified. So to that end, let's explore the areas in which RESTful APIs enhance architecture. First of all, APIs are ex excellent for externally facing APIs. You know, if you look at the architectural picture on the right-hand side of the screen, you'll see that B2B and B2C applications that live outside of the domain typically need to query stored data. APIs are great for this because they're easy to use, secure, and govern. API gateways or API management solutions can be used to proxy these APIs, both as a policy enforcement point from a security perspective and to support multiple API version backends. The key, however, is to use externally facing APIs for ca cases where ad hoc queries are required. If you notice that clients are making the same queries over and over again, then maybe they're just pulling the API, uh, which either means that the API is simply too coarse or that it's the wrong choice for what the clients really want. Maybe the clients really want a real-time stream of updates versus just pulling the API. So that's something to keep in mind. The next area where RESTful APIs enhance architecture is where you have internal queries or commands that require immediate confirmation. One of the things to consider is that since microservices are stateless, the data to which the data which needs to be queried must have already been in motion and persisted to the database. What I really mean by that is systems are generally acting upon external input. And so it's that external input that's being persisted into the database, meaning it's already been in motion. So essentially, if you think about it, APIs enable data at rest to be reconsumed by another application, again, in an ad hoc sort of way. Why this is important to consider is that APIs are not giving you a real-time state, but rather providing you data on demand. And these data on demand queries are perfect for a one-to-one -one type interaction in the request reply paradigm. Commands that require an immediate response or confirmation of action are also good candidates for APIs, but may not always be one-to-one -one interactions, which is something that we'll talk about in the next video. For now, just understand that APIs are good to use for external and query command type interactions, but also do come with some side effects when it comes to inner, inner process communications within microservices, which we'll discuss next. Since microservices are small and single in purpose, they must be chained together in order to achieve real business capabilities. As discussed in the previous video, Providing smart pipes, i.e. doing service orchestration within the infrastructure is really a bad thing. And doing it within your microservices is also an anti-pattern and a bad idea because this microservice, aka the orchestrator, becomes a scalability bottleneck just like it did back in the ESB world. Instead, 
The use of choreography has become much more widely used, but because each microservice is stateless and persists its view of the world into decentralized databases, there are a whole set of problems which can occur if you're to use RESTful APIs exclusively as the microservice interprocess communication medium, and ultimately that needs to be addressed. These types of problems range from failure scenarios that could lead to inconsistent state, to poor end user experience, poor scalability, resource utilization, the lack of agility, and dealing with scenarios where one-to-one -one interaction patterns is simply not enough. From my perspective, all of these problems are actually a symptom of tight service coupling. So instead of just taking my word for it, let's actually decompose this and go through each one, and I think you'll see what I mean. So let's talk failure scenarios, what I call rainy day cases. These are cases that always kept me up at night when I was working in system integration and system design, because for, for most cases, consistency is key. Even if that consistency is not transactional, it needs to happen eventually, because if it doesn't, the state of the system will become either hopelessly inconsistent or new applications will need to be developed in order to really watch for these types of inconsistencies, which is going to lead to time consuming um, application development and is really a band aid on top of this nasty inconsistency problem. So let's take a real case, such as microservice C failing after it updates its database state, meaning the local transaction to the database was successful, it then invokes microservice D, but then fails. Microservice B will get an error or a timeout and roll back, as can microservice A. Assuming B, but that's only assuming that B actually provides back an error. But what about microservice C and D? C is unable to roll back because it's failed, and D may be unaware of the failure of C. Ouch. Looking at this from the complexity perspective, each service has to have a lot of edge condition logic and understand the types of error conditions that can happen from downstream services. Know whether they can be handled or whether they need to be thrown back to the invoking service. Before you know it, your small single and purpose microservice has ballooned into having tons of error logic that's bloated and difficult to test. These are all symptoms of, site of tight service coupling. If all of these services are idempotent, then retries could fix this out of state issue, but whose responsibility is it to invoke that retry? And for how long are you to retry before you give up? And God forbid if they aren't idempotent, you'll never get your consistency back. So moving on to the next case, let's talk about user experience. So let's for a moment say that there's a user sitting at a web or mobile application and his, his actions, let's say he's creating an account, cause a series of microservices to execute. If all of these microservices have synchronous RESTful API interfaces, then essentially the response time is the sum of all downstream services, which is really sub-ideal. Secondly, because they're API interfaces, it can be difficult to add new services to the processing pipeline. We'll talk about that more later. Lastly, sure, there are asynchronous callbacks that could help enable parallelism and asynchronous behavior in this case, but the state during that asynchronous period has to be preserved for this to happen, which again incurs more complexity into each of these types of applications. Most times, many of these services are not required to execute serially. It just happens this way because if they're not immediately invoked, what would trigger them to fire later? To go along with the above scenario, consider the resource utilization, which in this case, services are in a blocked wait state waiting, wait, waiting and wasting resources because of the synchronous interactions. All the services must be scaled together instead of independently. So you get the worst of both worlds, expensive from a resource execution perspective and wildly expensive to scale when you ultimately will have to scale horizontally. And to me, really, what we've built accidentally is a distributed monolith. We have all the same pains of performance scalability, and cost, along with the reality of distributed computing, and we didn't actually achieve any of our agility goals. So let's prove out that we lost agility. Let's say that we wanted to add another microservice. We'll call it microservice E in this case, and it's to be executed in between microservice C and D. Since the interface is most likely different because it's a different API and has different behaviors, and because it's ultimately doing different functionality, the logic of microservice C must change, and even the new microservice 
which is to call D, must, must be updated to handle exceptional cases. In addition, the user experience gets worse. Resource and utilization and scalability is also worse. So again, how is this any better than a monolithic application? This really all is proof that APIs, while providing advantages in certain cases that we've discussed, can become problematic in the case of internal microservice interactions due to interface coupling. Look, there's always going to be data coupling, but interface coupling through APIs just adds complexity, and the fact that they're generally synchronous, without a lot of work, means that you have interface coupling and interaction behavior coupling. The last case, but one of the biggest to me, is the case where we make assumptions that interactions between two services are inherently one-to-one. -one. What do I mean? Well, as I commonly saw, and what commonly happens as part of big data and machine learning or even fraud detection systems, is other systems or applications want to consume these types of data elements. This typically forces existing applications to be refactored to invoke these other microservices, in this case, microservice C, or to use something like log, ag log aggregation services, such that really C is going to you know, connect up to one of those services, but you know, now you've added another component to fail. Uh, synch uh, synchronization uh, can be a challenge, and you're really not in the real-time data processing pipeline. Back in the day, we would have attempted to solve this paradigm maybe with an ESB, again, adding um, smarts into the infrastructure. You know, we would proxy microservice B and do orchestration with C. But again, it doesn't scale and adds latency and it's difficult to troubleshoot. So if you exclusively use REST APIs, you're really locked into a one-to-one -one paradigm and attempts to overcome that along with being synchronous come at the cost of writing additional complexity into the application. So to summarize why RESTful APIs aren't enough, I've created a list of requirements that I would need in order to achieve the benefits of using microservices. And obviously, I think these are a list of requirements that I would think most people would need. First, they need to be loosely coupled. I know that's a mantra that I keep mentioning, but it's so important. You know, it's actually in the definition of a microservice, um, and it's what you need in order to build new functionality quickly with low effort and reduced impacts to the other services. And as you've just seen, using REST APIs exclusively actually increases coupling. So only use them for externally facing APIs and queries and sometimes commands. In my career, I can't count the number of times that a piece of data produced by an application needed to be consumed by many more. Hence, one-to-many data distribution. And it's a requirement that should be thought about holistically and not built into your application. Your app should be building business capabilities, not dealing with routing, distribution, and error scenarios related to these other interested applications being down. Deferred execution. We'll talk much more about this in the next video, but if you can embrace eventual consistency, many operations can then happen asynchronously in the background, thus allowing a web UI or mobile application or even another service to return much more quickly and be resource friendly. But something that you must keep in mind is that in order to take advantage of, of deferred execution, you have to keep track of state and ensure that it gets executed and that, and that state ultimately belongs in the infrastructure. And finally, and I think they go in hand in hand, the state and data can't get lost or dropped because if it does, throw consistency, even if it's eventual consistency, out the door. And that's why you need an event broker. So hopefully you see the premise of our viewpoint. If you want decoupled services that can interact in an asynchronous way, they need to be event driven and they need to make use of a stateful intermediary called an event broker. So in our next video, we'll talk in depth about enhancing microservices with events and show the solution to the problems exposed in this episode. So stay tuned. In the meantime, if you have any questions or comments, please don't hesitate to contact us by visiting sols.com. Look forward to that next episode where we apply event-driven architecture to microservices, and I think you'll see it's a much better way. Thanks a lot.